Okay, so uh, today I'd like to give you a PowerPoint presentation to begin with that just sort of provides an overview of how uh, collections might be used in undergraduate uh, classes, uh, some of the, particularly the databases, and uh, an overview of a few of the things that we talked about in a research coordinating network that we ran for about six years uh, and involved quite a number of institutions across the U.S. Um, and then take you to uh, the AIMUP website, just so you're familiar with it and you know some of the resources that are there. And uh, ultimately, what I, what I want to do is point you to um, Blue, which is a new initiative that is sort of going far beyond what we did with AIMUP and uh, taking the uh, idea of using museum resources, particularly databases in undergraduate education and also citizen science and another number of other initiatives. And I'll also uh, briefly mention CUBES, which is another initiative that's underway uh, using uh, big data. Okay, so just as an overview, collections are critical uh, infrastructure and we're, as curators and collection managers, we're seeing many different kinds of investigators and uh, natural resource managers coming to use our collections. Um, and we're also discovering that many uh, many times the original purpose that collections were made um, is being extended to uh, new purposes, to sort of un unintended consequences. And so uh, we all, those of us that are active in the collection community are, are well familiar with uh, new technologies that have come along and been applied in new ways to address new questions based on these specimens. But what we, what I want to focus on today is this idea of how we might use collections to develop human capacity, or basically to use collections to teach. And uh, the RCN that I was involved in with uh, three other uh, co-PIs, Scott Edwards uh, uh, at Harvard and Stephanie uh, Bond at the University of Alaska, and uh, um, Eileen Lacey at UC Berkeley, was involved in focusing on undergraduate education, and that's what I want to talk about today. But collections are also great for broadening participation and uh, thinking about also how we can create a new generation of museum professionals, because we in the museum community have seen a tremendous uh, change in the ways we think about our collections and the ways we're being asked to actually uh, manage our collections and build them. So collections are great for undergraduate education because they uh, teach a number of really important concepts. Um, one concept is this idea of how we connect different kinds of data or different kinds of studies together. And museum collections are a natural nexus for tying together all different kinds of biodiversity-based science. Uh, a great example of that is if you've collected parasites from a vertebrate host, that you can tie together parasite biology with all of the research that's been done on the vertebrate uh, specimen. Collections also allow students to learn about t change across time if those collections are temporally deep. They uh, can help us teach about uh, geographic variation if the collections are geographically broad. And uh, we can also learn about individual variation if the collections are site intensive. That is, if many individuals have been collected from each site that has been sampled. Because the collections are georeferenced, they immediately enter into GIS applications. And so students can, again, begin to tie together time and space, individual variation, and a variety of other uh, GIS layers to understand biodiversity. An important point uh, for our community, the museum community, to, to uh, think about is that web uh, databases are no longer just for collection management, but now that we're making them web accessible, they are really being pulled into research, into public policy, and into education. This is a shot uh, from an Arctos, uh, one of the Arctos web pages. And if you look down the right side of that, you can see that this database attempts to uh, tie together many different kinds of 
um, uh, original data that were collected on specimens, which are in the database, but also derivative data that have been generated on those specimens subsequently. So that's the uh, blue arrow that you see that goes to GenBank there. Um, the specimens can also be uh, mapped in a variety of ways. Berkeley Mapper is one, Google Earth is another. The, uh, 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 as time goes on, we are learning about new specimen data streams, so uh, morphological data is being deposited in a variety of different repositories now, including CD CT scans, which generate tremendous amounts of data. Um, and most recently, uh, ISOBank is a new data repository for isotopic data. So these databases allow uh, investigators, but also for, you know, but also educators and students to begin to see how different kinds of data about biodiversity can be tied together. Arctos is just one of many databases. Uh, Arctos uh, is situated, uh, served out of the Texas Advanced Computing Center, and we uh, send data to a variety of data aggregators, uh, VertNet, iDigBio, uh, GBIF are examples, and then we're tied to other kinds of databases that handle uh, information that has been derived from these specimens like GenBank. Okay, with regard to building human capacity and revitalizing biology for undergrads, there have been a number of uh, calls uh, over the last uh, 20 years for uh, educators to rethink the way that we're doing STEM education in the U.S. And so uh, the AAAS put out a report, uh, Pulse put out a report, the president uh, special uh, task force uh, also put out a report, all of these uh, with the idea that we need to rethink the way that we uh, deliver our courses and primarily uh, in that the courses should be discovery based and active rather than passive uh, lecturing, which is what we've traditionally done. And that the, the courses should be relevant uh, to the student body that you're delivering them to. Okay, so again, uh, just to reemphasize, collections bring a lot to undergraduate education in terms of integrating. They can integrate the biotic with the abiotic. They can integrate from uh, genomes and cells up to whole organisms and to ecosystems. They're good for understanding scaling from across time and space, for complexity. Um, Web-based discovery, which is the way a lot of scientists are going to operate in the future. Uh, database exposure and also just the scientific process. We have challenges in the museum community if we're going to engage uh, undergraduate teachers in museum collections in their databases because few educators and few students seem to know about natural history collections or their role in the development of key concepts in biology. Um, it's also not so apparent how we access museum information and museum uh, databases or how we can incorporate specimen data in teaching. So what we tried to do with our RCN was to develop some examples, some what we call educational modules that would make it uh, easy for teachers to begin to think about how they might design uh, lesson plans around uh, specific examples in their own courses. Collections and databases have their limitations. Accessibility and ease of use is probably the biggest one. That is, it's most of the entry into these databases is pretty clunky and, and not so easy. And that's a large challenge for us is to make our databases, uh, design them so that it's very easy for people to get on and, and use them. Specimen availability sometimes becomes a problem in some regions of the U.S., uh, although as it turns out, the smaller university museums are excellent for having good regional coverage of biodiversity, and so you can construct very uh, nice place-based uh, lesson plans based on those smaller university museums. 
We also have a challenge in the museum community in that our tradition has been systematics and natural history, but now we're seeing a number of other scientists uh, use these collections, including ecologists, developmental biologists, uh, folks doing genomics, uh, pathogen discovery. A lot of geographers are interested in our databases because of the GIS applications and also artists because we have very authentic objects. So uh, collections have been developed for research and I think one of the uh, things that emerged from our uh, research coordinating network, AIMUP, was that it's not so hard to develop a lesson based on your own particular research program. And so um, if educators just give some thought, if they do specimen-based research to how they might turn their research program into a learning experience, um, it's pretty easy to develop a module based on the specimens perhaps that they have collected and added to this resource. Uh, as I mentioned, databases are developed for collection, were developed for collection management, not for education and outreach. And so that's another hurdle that we have to come across. Museums have a long tradition in education. Uh, one of those is uh, just direct student experiences and curation, um, getting students in the collection and learning about data, how to track data, what sorts of data are important. Uh, of course, a lot of field work has given student experiences in biology. And outreach through exhibit is a well, probably the best known uh, use of museum specimens in education and, and um, particularly with the general public. Uh, research experiences for undergraduates and graduate students. Um, this service is a fairly limited population, but is very important and is growing. So we have quite a bit of material that can quickly be pulled into an undergraduate research experience or serve as the basis for graduate projects. And then we, of course, use specimens in classrooms. So those are all, those five are sort of the traditional ways that specimens have been used in education. New uses in education include uh, more and more samples are being pulled into uh, molecular biology labs, for example, or uh, visualization labs that might be doing uh, 3D scanning or different kinds of uh, multidimensional uh, analyses. And so we had a proposal funded, as I mentioned, called AMOP, which was for advancing the integration of museums into undergraduate programs. It ran for about six years, and uh, in this we really tried to uh, bridge some borders and to do some new things beyond sort of the traditional uses of specimens in education. One of the biggest borders we had early on was just crossing taxonomic borders because, as it turns out, museums tend to be very siloed taxonomically with the herpetologist maybe not talking to the botanists or so on and so forth. Um, we brought together educators with museum staff and biologists with education specialists. We talked a lot about informatics and databases, which is an emerging field for all of us, but particularly for museums. And we brought in artists and geographers and other folks, folks representing GenBank and agencies, to talk about the ways that we could think about incorporating museum specimens into education. This was the network that was set up of institutions, and people that were involved. And um, the thing that I want to talk to you about today is these educational modules. And this is the one we're going to focus on, which is the island biogeography model looking at species richness across um, this Alexander Archipelago, which is a place that I've worked for 29 years. So basically, this module is based on the specimens that our field crews had collected uh, over a period of about three decades from numerous islands, providing a, a data set that would allow students to go in and sort of ask their own questions and pull down data from the databases uh, to test key concepts and skills in evolution and ecology. And uh, we're going to focus today on uh, the fourth one of those under the key concepts and skills there, isolation and 
uh, I, actually the second one, Island Biogeography, which has to do with island size and island distance from the mainland. Um, body size on islands is also another one that can be tested, and that has been developed uh, further um, in this new RCN that Anna Monfils is running, which is called Blue. And so this is the Biodiversity Literacy um, RCN. So this is a new NSF uh, initiative that is centered out of central Michigan. And so I want to make sure you folks uh, um, are able to access this website and check out all the resources that they've developed. And Blue has been working very closely with this CUBES effort, which is another NSF-sponsored uh, program to bring uh, big data to biology in terms of education. And so those are sort of the active initiatives right now. AIM UP is over and has been over for a few years. And I'm going to take you to the AIM UP website, but you should recognize that there's a lot more going on in terms of development of educational modules and other efforts at this point. Okay, so let's go to the AIMUP website. And so this is at aimup.unm.edu. You can, uh, I think, just Google AIMUP um, at UNM and you can find it. And uh, again, this website is one that is not so active anymore, but it still has a number of resources on it. And I still am contacted by teachers um, who have questions about uh, how to use the modules and so on and so forth. So this ran for six years. Um, we had uh, five themes that we addressed. You can see here, uh, the first one was integrative inventories. And that was that idea of just breaking down the barriers between that exists taxonomically within museums. We did one on geographic variation and coevolution. We did one on evolutionary dynamics of genomes, uh, one on climate change, and then the last one was the human dimension of natural history. And these RCNs are basically an effort to bring people together from uh, different institutions to talk about specific issues, and uh, in some cases to build up uh, resources and so for educators, if you go here, um, one of the outcomes was these modules and tutorials. And so on this part of the website, if you go to educational modules, which is shown right here, uh, if you get a list of some of the modules that were uh, developed during that uh, time span. So uh, the first one is how to read a scientific paper. And that's actually one that we'll come back to later because it is a very nice introduction to the island uh, biogeographical, bi biogeography module that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the scientific papers that are introduced um, in this module actually deal with Southeast Alaska and some of the literature uh, related to uh, island uh, biogeography and island evolution. There is also an introduction to using the Arctos database here. So um, this provides sort of an overview of uh, how folks can access the database and how they can use it to pull down the kind of data that they're interested in. And there are a variety of other ones that are a little bit more specific. All of these are sort of listed as introductory some of them were developed with artists. So the rock pocket mouse, for example, here, adaptation by natural selection, was uh, uh, developed with uh, the honors program here on campus and also a number of artists to sort of focus on uh, natural selection with regard to uh, lava flows and the white sands and how rock pocket mice pelage the color of the fur uh, varies depending on the background coloration of the soil. So from very light in the white sands to very dark in the lava flows. Um, at the intermediate level here, we've got this one called Island Biogeography. So if you click on that, 
Um, there are uh, three different uh, parts to this module. Uh, and uh, one is a data file, which we'll look at in just a second. Another one is uh, a, uh, this island biogeography presentation is actually a PowerPoint presentation. It's aimed at the teacher so that the teacher has a ready-made uh, introduction to the module that they can show to the class, and we'll step through that uh, briefly. And then this last one is a written uh, module that has instructions on it for the students and the teacher as to how they can go about asking particular questions and, and getting to the data. So let's start first with the presentation. And this is a very, uh, starts out as a very general presentation, um, sort of introducing the role of museums in uh, biodiversity. So if we ask this question, where do species occur and how did they get there? Um, we can begin to say, how do we study, for example, mammal occurrence? And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to apologize, but this is a very mammal-centric um, presentation because that's what I do. Um, we can ask the question of how do we know where species occur and where do we get that information? So some of that comes from uh, published work and reports like this. And so this is one of the resources that is available and you can a uh, teacher can download it or the students can download it. It's a PDF on the mammals of this region, which is a coastal region in southeast Alaska called the Alexander Archipelago. And uh, another way we can get data is we can explore online museum data. And that's going to be our detective work. So we would go to Arctos. And this uh, is what it looks like. We'll go to this uh, in just a bit. Notice that this was accessed just a few years ago. It's got 1.7, almost 1.8 million records. And it's now at about 3.6, I think, 3.5. So this database has continued to grow as more collections have come in. But these are the, the fields that you'll find if you access the Arctos database online. And allows uh, folks to basically select uh, the kind of information that they might be searching for. So they might search on identification of taxonomy, or they might be interested in a particular locality. Or typically, they will combine a particular species from a particular locality, which is what we're going to do to get information. You can go to museum databases. Um, if you want to find out about mammal occurrence, you might explore other databases uh, that might have information. Or another way is you might go out and do field work and collect new data. So just trying to make the tie between where, for example, museum data come from with regard to uh, field work. So here's what field, our field expeditions looked like which in Alaska involves a lot of different modes of transportation. Um, and then uh, we can ask about mammals, but we might also want to understand uh, the relationship of the mammals to plants, or perhaps to other vertebrates, or to geology, or even archaeology, paleontology. And uh, a lot of work is going on in southeast Alaska in all these fields that could be tied together because uh, they all occur in the same region. This is an island archipelago, which allows us to introduce some ecological concepts and some evolutionary concepts. And so the teacher can sort of step through some of those concepts. The idea that each island is a simplified subset of the mainland with regard to biodiversity. So there are fewer species sometimes making that easier to study because there's less complexity. And so then we step through a few examples. Uh, here is a shrew. Um, on the mainland, there's up to five species of shrews. But when you get to the islands, you typically only get one species or another, yellow being the dusky shrew and the red being the scenario shrew. So they don't tend to both co-occur on islands. The same way when we look at big carnivores, um, black bears and wolves tend to occur together down in this region here in the southern part of the archipelago, and brown bears are found in the northern ABC islands, 
uh, to the exclusion of black bears and wolves. Same way when we look at rodents, a long-tailed vole is found throughout the islands of Southeast with the exception of some of these islands that have meadow voles on them or perhaps have the root vole. So each island has fewer species, uh, but we have a lot of islands in this archipelago, so that increases the complexity somewhat. I don't know what kinds of questions you're asking. There is this idea that smaller islands should have fewer organisms and large islands should have more, particularly large islands that are near the mainland, which would be the source for colonization. So distance and size of the island should be important in determining species diversity. And so uh, we can ask, can we test these ideas on our islands in Southeast Alaska? So we go to the database and we could query the database by particular islands to see how many species of mammals there are or how many mammals there are in that and then we could take the data that we get from that query and we could um, reduce it to just the number of species of mammals and then we could do that for a number of different islands based on their size to see um, if size has an impact and so here's an example of looking at distance and this would be the idea that the farther you get from the mainland, the lower the diversity. And so if you run these transects, here's a transect A, which goes from the mainland here towards the west, in this case the southwest, to Douglas Island and Admiralty Island, Chichigoff, Baranoff, and all the way out to Kruzoff Island out here, you can see that the number of species of mammals on those islands decreases. And so they could run a number of these transects <clears throat> across the islands to see if distance has an impact. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions that the students might ask that the teacher could introduce to them. And the teacher could make a connection between uh, the science that we're doing and the management needs of this area. Uh, as it turns out, this entire area here, almost the entire area, about 17 million acres of it, is managed by the USDA Forest Service. And so the Forest Service and the managers, the wildlife managers, have certain questions that they uh, might have and the information that they would need to know to effectively manage a large archipelago like this. Questions about connectivity, for example, uh, between the islands or between the islands and the mainland. Should they be managing this as uh, a number of independent units, or do maybe some of these islands together form a natural unit that they could manage to reduce the complexity of their management scheme? Um, and that then leads uh, can lead uh, an educator to think about evolutionary concepts. This idea that uh, Archipelagos are important for understanding evolution because divergence tends, uh, tends to occur in isolation. So if you isolate populations, they tend to diverge. And over time, that leads to this concept of island endemics, that is uh, populations or subspecies or species that have diverged enough that you can recognize them as uh, distinctive. And of course, that's what Darwin did in the Galapagos Island with his finches. And so this is the evolutionary concept that isolation over time will lead to divergence. Um, and time and isolation then become very important to document and become very fundamental even to uh, resource managers if they're trying to manage these wildlife populations. And so we can ask the question, how connected are island populations? and over what time scale has diversification occurred on the Alexander Archipelago. And so then that brings in this whole idea of how long have species persisted on those islands? What, was, what were the geologic conditions like in the past? Um, have species persisted on these islands for tens of thousands of years? Or have they fairly recently colonized the archipelago? And um, that can lead into ideas or concepts uh, about how environments and species distributions are changing 
is just a slide showing po polar bears with brown bears together, which is unusual. Um, and so you can focus on this and you can begin to ask questions about uh, how glacial advances and the Pleistocene might have impacted mammals. And so this, this goes on and on, depending on how uh, much time an educator might want to devote to a lesson plan focused on a particular area so that students could fully understand how geologic history and climate history has impacted the diversity of a particular region. And I'm going to skip over these slides. Just showing, though, that um, if an educator wanted to spend a couple weeks on a, on a lesson plan like this, they could weave in uh, ecological principles, and evolutionary principles, and how geology can impact uh, biodiversity. Here you can see the islands were much more connected 8,000 years ago when sea levels were lower than they are today. And we can ask the question, then, how did species re-enter or colonize the area? Were there glacial refugia that might have impacted it? If a teacher wanted to, there are a lot of genetic data associated with these specimens where a teacher could actually have students, perhaps in an advanced uh, uh, evolution course or a genetics course, download uh, gene sequences from specimens uh, from different islands to see how divergent uh, the specimens are across the archipelago, across different islands, or from the uh, archipelago to um, the mainland. OK, and then there is a lot of information. So here's an example of how they could build a tree and how you would actually ask that question, how you could look at species and how distinctive they are across the archipelago. So basically, this module has many different directions that a teacher could take it um, in a, from a 200 level course to a more advanced course to sort of look at the evolution of a fauna and how that basic science might actually be important for thinking about uh, conservation, uh, thinking about um, wildlife management, and thinking about even conservation biology. OK. Um, let's go ahead and, and take a break there. There's a little bit about deforestation. This is actually a very hot topic right now in Southeast because uh, our current uh, federal administration has just decided uh, to uh, go into the old growth forest there and start harvesting old growth forest trees again. So very timely. Let's take a look. Let's go back here and take a look at the module. So that was the presentation that we just gave you, and a teacher could take any part of that that they might want as background information for a class. This is the module. Islands is a tool for teaching ecology and evolution. Basically, that provides sort of the background and the literature on um, island biogeography and what we know about islands and endemics and differences between oceanic islands and continental islands or land bridge islands. Um, introduces concepts related to uh, how body size, how we might predict body size might change on islands uh, in comparison to the mainland. Uh, this idea of the island rule is proposed by Foster. Um, that island rule is actually a, a separate module that's been developed. Uh, it can be it can be done at the same time as the uh, module that we're going to look at here, which is based on diversity, on species diversity on the islands. Uh, but it can be done at the same time based on the same specimens if you simply download the, the uh, information related to body weights or some other measurement uh, that would give us a correlate to body size. OK, so let's first look at this, the influence of island size distance and elevation on species richness across a northern latitude archipelago. And the key concepts here are going to be island biogeography principles, uh, the scientific process and hypothesis testing. So the students will erect their own hypotheses and test them, an introduction to st statistical tests, t-tests and regression, 
um, and online database use, availability, and just sort of introduction to data uh, per se, in that um, students quickly learn about the limits of data. It turns out there's a lot of a lot we don't know, and there's a lot of data that are not available or questions that we might want to ask. And that's often a, a revelation. OK, this we actually tied into our Biology 203 course here. And so this is some of the chapters that might be relevant uh, for an undergraduate educator. Obviously, they'd have to check their own textbook if they're using. Um, as I mentioned before, this can be extended to higher level courses. Uh, some of the skills that would be gained would be computer database search, again, statistics, literature search, how to look at the literature, uh, scientific writing, writing lab reports. And uh, the lab report requirements are laid out here. OK, there's background information that's provided um, on uh, sort of the species distributions. We talked about that already in that introduction and some of the key island biogeography trends, uh, how we might expect species diversity to be related to island area or distance. Um, OK, so let's look at the third piece of that. which is the data. So this is a Excel file that comes, uh, that, that can be downloaded here. Let's see, that's my budget. You don't want to look at that. Okay, so what is already given for the teacher here is a number of the islands that occur in southeast Alaska in this Alexander Archipelago and their size. So this is their area in square meters over here. This is the name of the island down this column here, B. And then there are different ways that these islands could be bend. Um, for this uh, exercise, we have uh, four, four bends and then the mainland, which is the fifth bend here. So uh, basically, uh, we have the students think about what their predictions might be for island size um, and numbers of species. Hopefully, their prediction is that the smaller the island, the fewer number of species. And we ask them to take uh, a number of replicate samples of islands, so two or three from each of these bends. They can make their own bends if they want to. They could make their own cutoff so they can see how you know, bending might influence their results. Um, and uh, then they would take this island name and they would go to the database to Arctos and they would put that island, um, uh, they would search for that island for uh, numbers of mammals. So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's take Edelin Island here, and we'll go to Arctos. Let's see here. Which is here. And the thing you're going to want to do when you get to Arctos is you're going to want to go ahead and create a user ID because without a user um, ID, uh, you can't download data. But user IDs are free and easy, no problem. So we've got Tuco Joe one which I actually created this morning because if I log in under my usual username, um, I can only work within my own collection here, and that's because of our virtual private databases. So I have special access to our database, but I don't have access to Berkeley's database or any of the other ones. And so here I'm just going to go in as a uh, uh, user ID I created this morning so that I can search all of the databases that are on Arctos. 
Okay, so that's simple. We still have the search up here. If you look under collections here, there are a variety of different collections that are in Arctos. I'm going to search them all, so I'm not going to select an option there. We're going to go down here and we're going to select uh, under identification and taxonomy, we're going to select class mammalia. And then we're going to come down here to locality and we're going to go to island and we're going to select Edelin. I can spell right, Edelin. Edelin Island. And then we're going to do a search. With Arctos, you can see over on the right side here, there are a bunch of random things you can do that, or that an educator could do to just to learn about Arctos if they don't want to go through the, the learning module that's there available. So these are the specimen records that came back for Edelin Island. And so these are the museum records over here, and um, these are the species and the country, and there's more information obviously here than we need. So you can actually customize what you might want to download in an Excel spreadsheet up here by going add or remove data fields. To do that, you can go in here and check the ones that you might want to add or remove. Okay, and you can see there's quite a bit of information. You don't want to check too many of those because it takes a little longer to pull the information. But let's just look down through this quickly here. You can see that there are different species. Um, and if we're lucky, there will be some species that perhaps we might not want to include um, in our down download. And this gets to the point of after we've done a search and we've customized maybe the, the fields that we want to download and download, then you want to think about um, cleaning up the data and you want your, your students to think about that. Because, for example, using mammalia, we will download not only terrestrial mammals, but also marine mammals. And it may be that if we're thinking about island size um, and distance from the mainland impacts that marine mammals uh, are not the kind of information that we would want to include in such a search. Let me just quickly point out that each of these records, so here's a Sorex Monticlus, for example, from the University of Alaska Museum that is listed as a voucher. And so if we click on that, um, for each of these, you get a screen like this that gives us a lot more information about that specimen. And so in this case, this is a voucher for this paper by Baltensperger and Hoytman in 2015. Uh, and so you could click on that and find uh, out what that uh, publication is. And so Arctos tracks publications. So here's the publication from PLOS One in 2015 on predicted shifts in small mammal distributions and biodiversity in the altered future environment of Alaska. Um, you can also see here that there are a number of GenBank accessions that go with this specimen. So this is, again, how uh, students might get into these databases and begin to poke around and, and see that different kinds of information are connected. And they might, for example, want to download this data for this shrew and see how this shrew, or maybe several specimens of this shrew on Edelin Island are related to shrews on other islands or shrews on the mainland. So they could click on this accession, for example, and go right to GenBank and uh, download from GenBank the, um, either the uh, uh, ACTs and Gs, or if this is translated, this should be translated here somewhere into, it's like this one isn't, into amino acids. Okay, but you can toggle back and forth, and there's a lot of different directions you could go, you could map this specimen if you wanted to. And so here's Edelin Island. Uh, this is in Berkeley Mapper. You could also map it in Google Earth. And you can see where that specimen comes from. And you can start to get a feel for just how complex the region is there in southeast Alaska. 
Okay. Uh, moving right along, I think, let's see. So you download your data. Um, you'd want to then clean your data. You just want your students to look at it. If we go back to the specimens here, you can see that some of these uh, specimens are actually taken all the way to subspecies. And so students, if they're might not paying attention, might conclude that this specimen, Myotes gapperi rangeli, is different than this uh, specimen here, is a different species, Myotis gapperi. And so you have to show them that subspecies are different than species in the database. Um, I would, you know, with this database, encourage the students to uh, map all of the records. Although we searched on Edelin Island, if you go in here and uh, map the results, let's in this case map them to Google Earth. Let's see here. Oh, Google Earth isn't optimized for. Let's see what we got here. Kind of got the latest version though. We may go. We may go back to uh, Berkeley Mapper here. So here, these records are mapped in Southeast Alaska, and you can see that one record. Maybe you can't quite see it on your screen. Let me blow this up a little bit here for us. One of these records uh, doesn't appear to be from Edelin Island, it's sitting out here in the ocean. So that's the record that, again, you would want students to, to take a close look at and make sure that this is indeed, you know, uh, an Edelin record and that it, it wasn't mistakenly uh, placed in the, in the database. Okay, then the students uh, basically would tally the number of uh, species for each island. They would go back to their um, spreadsheet. And um, they, this is an example. Uh, this is actually a body size here. Here's species diversity. And they could run a t-test uh, comparing the number of species on here we have two islands in group one, the smallest islands, two islands in group two, two islands in group three, two and four, and then the mainland. They could run a t-test to see if they are signif significantly different across those five bins, with the prediction being the smallest island would have the fewest species. I see that I've hit 150. Maybe we should pause here and just see if there's questions. Or if you'd like me to plow on. Any questions? Anybody Joe, typed anything? Yeah. Let me let me Yeah, we don't have any questions. questions in the chat yet. If there's anything you want to just wrap okay. up. Yeah, let me take you quickly to uh, to the blue site and then to cubes. Here is the blue site. I mentioned that earlier. You can actually find uh, uh, under modules here. Uh, you can find a module that is based on the island rule for mammal size. So it's it basically, instead of looking at diversity on the islands, um, in this case, they're looking for does body size change on the islands? And so this module has been further developed by Blue and also here by Cubes. And so Cubes is the other, if you're interested in using um, museum data in your courses, another resource that you definitely would want to check out. And so let's see, if we take a look here, this is a module that's on Cubes. And this is an investigation of island biogeography. So basically, it's the same module that has been uh, further developed. And it's, it's basically uh, uh, shows the aim up. But this has been further developed by the CUBES group with additional resources. OK.
Great. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, I encourage you, if you have questions, you can go ahead and um, type them in the chat box. And I'm also going to enable your microphone. So if you'd just like to ask a question out loud, you can go ahead and do so. Just make sure that the little green microphone icon at the top of your screen is indeed green and not just grayed out, and we'll be able to hear you. Um, I think Anna is typing, but I'll just go ahead and kick at things off. So do you have a sense of um, sort of the volume of usage of the modules um, and any sort of feedback regarding ease of use or kind of successes from educators? Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's been used by a number of folks. Anna may have a better sense now that it's actually uh, being used by Blue and by Cubes, and I think that they're tracking our, again, our RCN has been over for about four or five years, but I periodically get contacted by folks that have used it or that are interested in, you know, transporting it to a different system. Um, there was a homeschooler uh, in southeast Alaska, so right there living in uh, a place called Thorn Bay, Alaska, where the grocery market is called the Clear Cut Market. And these students uh, used it for their state Alaska science fair project, and they won second place uh, doing just exactly what I just stepped through with you with regard to diversity. OK, so Anna says that uh, Very cool. is not developing materials, but uh, is supporting what's being created by Blue. Okay, and there and Blue is doing a much better job of tracking downloads and, and views. We we actually didn't do that. Oh, great! So there's some analytics. That's great. Yeah. And um, have you had sort of um, sessions with educators on on like constructive feedback and? been able to incorporate that in modules or how does that work yeah I think Anna might want to ask that she's she's really taken this into that next level of uh, you know getting the feedback with the educators and building a larger educator network we basically sort of built the concept and some of the early modules and then our RCN was over so Anna what what do you what do you got going on in blue Still with us? There's a little bit of a delay, so oh, she's, she's typing. typing. There she goes. She doesn't have audio. No, oh, doesn't have audio. Well, I'm sure people can check out Blue and see sort of what's been updated and, and new modules they've been adding. Any other questions? I am going to post the link to the um, webinar survey just while you guys are thinking up more questions. Um, it takes one to two minutes, and it gives both IDIG Bio as well as Arctos just good feedback on webinars and gives you a chance to voice any um, anything you'd like to see from us in the future. So I encourage you to just take one minute to do that. Right, Carla's got a question. And feel free to speak too if, if you do have um, microphones. Just give Carla a second. I don't know if she's trying to connect her audio. Uh, Carla, turn up your volume. I can barely hear you.
How's that? There you go. Okay. Yep, that's good. Different microphone. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about, in addition to getting feedback on the, the modules themselves and the use of those modules, it would be nice. You know, one of the things that we've talked about in Arctos quite a bit, um, Joe, as you know, is is ease of use and sort of the interface usability. And um, we've talked about trying to get funding to improve that. And it would be great to somehow connect with the people that are using it for these sorts of educational uses to get feedback on how we can improve it to make it more um, accessible and easy to use on it just generally. Yeah, Anna, maybe that's something you could put into your evaluation is uh, suggestions on how to how to improve that interface. All right, looks like we have a question from Beth coming as well. So Beth asks, do you guys ever have requests to modify your modules to static type displays? I'll let Anna address that, I guess. I'm not sure what a static type display is. Perhaps like a exhibit. Yeah, so something like an educational exhibit for a school. <laughs> yeah, just so have you had any requests to, to sort of adapt that into an exhibit at all? Yeah, I'm through. I'm racking my brain. Any I responses? I can't remember uh, anybody proposing that, but it, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody's proposed that. It's a good idea. Oh, yeah, we have videos. And Anna um, says, did you show the videos, Joe? <laughs> No, I didn't show them, and, and there is on that AIMUP site a number of videos. Uh, let me see if I can show you real quick where those are. Uh, we can get back there. So under resources, let's see, where are our videos? I think they were down on this side, I think. Way over there. So there are a number of videos here that talk about collections and using collections in research. Some of them are pretty pretty good. Some of them maybe not so good. <laughs> Actually, we spent a lot of time with a videographer, and uh, so they were a number of these were professionally done, and uh, provide a really nice introduction to the concept of using museum collections and data in undergraduate courses. That's great. Great resource. Yep. And how to taxidermy a squirrel. It's <laughs> good. Oh. <laughs> great. All right. Um, if, unless if there's any. Oh, go ahead. Are there any last questions? Looks like we've hit our time. 
Oh, Science um, Live, right. One last comment. <laughs> great job. Yeah, thanks, right. Joe. That was great. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Yep, thanks. Bye. And I'll have the recording of this posted tomorrow. Thanks, everyone, for joining right. Adios, us. As we say See here. you next yeah. month. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.